How does Mark Antony persuade the crowd? So here's some context. Brutus and his buddies, who are Roman politicians, have just murdered Julius Caesar, who was a very popular and successful Roman general. They've killed Caesar because, well, it's complicated, but basically they feel threatened by Caesar's popularity. To illustrate, at one point in the play, Brutus compares Caesar to a serpent's egg. He explains that right now, Caesar is vulnerable, but eventually he'll become deadly. So the sooner they kill him, the better. Brutus and his buddies assassinate Julius Caesar, and the Roman people want answers. We will be satisfied, they say. In other words, tell us what's going on. Brutus then delivers a speech to an audience of Roman people, logically explaining why Caesar had to be killed. Believe it or not, the Roman people buy it. After the speech, they find nothing wrong with Brutus' actions and they support Caesar's murder. So everything seems fine and dandy. Despite Caesar's popularity, Brutus has killed him and convinced the Roman people that the murder is justified. Here's the thing. Mark Antony, another Roman politician, is not happy about any of this. He's a loyal friend to Julius Caesar and can't let Brutus get away with murder. Mark Antony is faced with two difficult problems. First, he is surrounded by Brutus and other murderous politicians. He is heartbroken over Caesar's death, but he can't be outspoken about it. He needs to appear as if he agrees with the murder, or he's at risk of being murdered himself. Second, the Roman people seem convinced by Brutus's speech. They side with Brutus and are celebrating Caesar's death. Mark Antony would rather that the people were on his side and outraged by Caesar's murder. So what does Mark Antony do? Well, he needs to appear as if he agrees with the murderers and persuade the Romans that Caesar's murder was unjustified. This seems an impossible task with two contradictory objectives, but incredibly, Mark Antony succeeds and his success is undoubtedly a shining moment in Shakespeare's play. Now that you have some context, let's go back in time to the moment when Caesar has just been killed. Mark Antony is basically standing over Caesar's dead body, chatting with the murderers. It's definitely an awkward situation. Mark Antony shakes each of the murderers' hands and tells them that although he loved Caesar, surely there are good reasons why Caesar was murdered. He's pretending to side with them so that they grant him a favor. He then politely asks Brutus if he might say a few words to the Roman people about Caesar. Mark Antony wishes to give a speech. Cassius, one of the murderers, is suspicious and says privately to Brutus, do not consent that Antony speaks in his funeral. Know you how much the people may be moved by that which he will utter? Cassius is worried that Mark Antony's speech will be so emotionally charged that he will inspire the Romans to revolt in anger in response to Caesar's murder. Brutus replies, I will myself into the pulpit first and show the reason of our Caesar's death. 
Brutus will deliver a speech before Mark Antony's speech, and Brutus has confidence that he will get the Romans on his side, and as a result, Mark Antony's speech will be inconsequential. Brutus then delivers a speech to the Roman people, logically explaining why Caesar had to be killed, and the Roman people eat it up. They support Brutus and Caesar's murder. Then it's Mark Antony's turn. And remember, and I apologize for repeating myself, but this is such an important detail to understand the speech, Mark Antony needs to appear as if he agrees with the murderers, while persuading the Romans that Caesar's murder was unjustified. Let's look at seven ways Mark Antony convinces the Roman people that Caesar's death was unjustified and that as a result, they should revolt. He takes a gentle approach. He repeats the words honorable and ambitious. He provides examples of Caesar's good character. He uses rhetorical questions. He makes the Romans feel guilty. He teases Caesar's will. And finally, he humanizes Caesar and brutally describes his dead body. Let's talk about each of these points in more detail one by one. A gentle approach. Before Mark Antony begins speaking, the Romans are riled up by Brutus's speech. They're saying things like, this Caesar was a tyrant, and we are blessed that Rome is rid of him. The average Roman imagines Caesar as evil and is ready to pounce on anybody who contradicts this view. So Mark Antony can't come out and say, Caesar was amazing, or the people would turn against him. He needs a gentle approach to convince them. Therefore, Mark Antony plays a delicate game with his words, walking a tightrope. He begins by giving indications that he is on the Roman people's side. He greets them kindly as friends, Romans, countrymen, but more importantly, he assures them that he is not going to defend Caesar. He says, I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. Then he says, the noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault, and grievously hath Caesar answered it. These words would seem to suggest that Mark Antony agrees with Brutus and the Roman people but there are a few key phrases here, which gently prod his audience into sympathizing with Caesar. The phrase, if it were so, which translates to, if it were true, opens room for doubt. Was Caesar really that ambitious? And the phrase, grievously has Caesar answered it, suggests that Caesar's punishment, death, was too harsh and out of proportion. These phrases are only hints, meager suggestions, but they plant the seed in the Romans' minds that Caesar might not have been as bad as they think he was. Mark Antony sprinkles hints like these throughout the first half of his speech, each of which works a subtle magic on the Romans, leading them to side with Caesar. Now let's talk about repetition of the words honorable and ambitious. 
in the first 34 lines of his speech, Mark Antony uses the words ambitious and honorable five times each. These are two key adjectives that fuel the Romans' hatred for Caesar. After all, Brutus says that Caesar's out-of-control ambition is why he needed to be murdered. And this murder is legitimate because Brutus is an honorable man. Let's first talk about the repetition of the word ambitious in the following lines. But Brutus says he was ambitious. Line 90. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. Line 97. And word for word, exactly like line 97, yet Brutus says he was ambitious. Line 102. Each time Mark Antony describes Caesar as ambitious, it is contextualized as hearsay, as mere opinion. He doesn't say, Caesar was ambitious. But rather, Brutus says he was ambitious. Without being forceful or overly direct, this opens the door to the interpretation that Brutus is wrong. Brutus is just one person with one opinion. Maybe he's wrong. What do other people say? What does Mark Antony say? Mark Antony's repetition of the word honorable undermines Brutus's argument in a different way. Consider these lines. For Brutus is an honorable man, line 86. And Brutus is an honorable man, line 91. And Brutus is an honorable man, line 98. And sure, he is an honorable man, 103. In this case, each time Mark Antony describes Brutus as honorable, it's not contextualized as hearsay. It's spoken directly, which you would think gives credence to the idea that Brutus is, indeed, an honorable man. Thing is, this constant repetition leads to an effect like semantic satiation, which is when you repeat a word so many times that it loses its meaning. I can remember doing this with my friends in the schoolyard, repeating a word again and again without pause until it didn't seem like a word anymore, but just a meaningless noise. Well, you can imagine the same thing is happening here. Mark Antony repeats the word honorable so many times that his audience becomes numb to its meaning. The eighth time Mark Antony uses the word honorable, a Roman, remarking on Brutus and his co-conspirators, shouts, they were traitors, honorable men. At this point, the Roman people are in on the joke, so to speak, and the word honorable has been tainted. It becomes code to mean malicious and disloyal. Examples of Caesar's good character. Mark Antony provides three key examples, either events in Caesar's life or his behaviors, to prove that Caesar was not ambitious, but rather humble and generous. Example one. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill? Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? Example 2. When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Example 3. You all did see that on the looper call, I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? 
I like to think of Mark Antony's speech as having two dimensions. He appeals to both the Romans' minds and hearts, their reason and their emotion. These examples provide a factual basis upon which Mark Antony sprinkles rhetorical techniques that appeal to his audience's emotions, like repetition or rhetorical questions. And that leads me into this way in which Mark Antony persuades the crowd by using rhetorical questions. In brief, Rhetorical questions are questions that don't require answers. They're asked for effect, to place emphasis on some point. Hey, I have a free ticket to the hockey game this evening. Do you want to come with me? Is the sky blue? Of course I want to go with you. The question, do you want to come with me, requires an answer. But the question, is the sky blue, does not. The sky is obviously blue. So asking is the sky blue is another way of saying, obviously I will accept your free ticket. It's a rhetorical question because it's asked for effect to place emphasis on the point that the answer is certainly yes. In two of the previous examples, Mark Antony asks rhetorical questions. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? And was this ambition? Neither question requires an answer. Caesar, obviously, does not come across as ambitious for trying to bring wealth to the state, nor does he come across as ambitious for refusing the crown. The last line of Mark Antony's speech includes a rhetorical question. He says, Here was a Caesar. When comes such another? The answer to this question is obvious. There will never be another Caesar. In fact, in response to this question, a Roman, bursting with emotion, shouts out, Never, never. And so, Mark Antony's rhetorical questions give his audience an opportunity to participate in his speech and strengthen his message. Now let's talk about guilt tripping. Although Brutus convinces many Romans to hate Caesar and to believe that he deserved death, Mark Antony knows that these same Romans have celebrated Caesar in the past. He says, You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then? to mourn for him. Mark Antony is pointing out the hypocrisy. You loved Caesar for good reason in the past, so why aren't you sad now that he's dead? Mark Antony takes it a step further and says, O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts and men have lost their reason. This is daring. He insults his audience, but recovers by apologizing, asking them to have patience with him, for he is deeply saddened by Caesar's death. Bear with me, he says. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar and I must pause till it come back to me. The Roman people, accused of hypocrisy, of being unfeeling animals, witness Mark Antony's display of emotion, his vulnerability, and it affects them, inspires guilt. Mark Antony rubs it in, later saying, referring to Caesar, Now he lies there, and none so poor to do him reverence. Mark Antony might as well be saying, Feel bad, 
my fellow Romans, feel bad about yourselves and feel terrible about Caesar's death. Teasing the Will Mark Antony's speech really heats up when he introduces Caesar's will, a document Caesar wrote in the event of his death, detailing his final wishes. For the Romans, this will quickly become a source of mystery and excitement. Mark Antony casually introduces it and then builds it up, describing how much the Romans will love Caesar after hearing his will. Mark Antony pretends to resist the urge to read the will, in fear that their emotions will be too intense. But here's a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it in his closet. Tis his will. Let but the commons hear this testament, which, pardon me, I do not mean to read. And they would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds, and dip their napkins in his sacred blood. Yea, beg a hair of him for memory, and, dying, mention it within their wills, bequeathing it as a rich legacy unto their issue. In the end, Mark Antony reveals that Caesar has left the Romans money and parts of his private estate, which serves to further galvanize them into action against Brutus. Finally, let's talk about how Mark Antony humanizes Caesar and describes his dead body. Mark Antony compels his audience to think of Caesar as a man, not as an idea or a celebrity, but as a regular human with frailties and friends. It's important to note that when Brutus delivers his speech, Caesar's dead body is hidden away. But Mark Antony brings it with him speaking while Caesar's bloody, dead body is present on display for the Romans to see. Caesar was stabbed 23 times, each murderer taking a turn, and Mark Antony remarks on each knife wound and who among the conspirators delivered it. He says, Look, in this place ran Cassius's dagger through. See what a rent the envious Casca made. Through this, the well-beloved Brutus stabbed. Now the Romans can see for themselves how brutally Caesar was murdered. Mark Antony goes an extra step. He wants the Romans to see the dead body of a friend, not a military general. He says, He was my friend, faithful and just to me. And he provides an excerpt from a personal anecdote. You all do know this mantle. I remember the first time ever Caesar put it on. It was on a summer's evening in his tent. That day he overcame the Nervi. So let's review the seven different ways Mark Antony convinces the Roman people that Caesar's death was unjustified. He takes a gentle approach. He repeats the words honorable and ambitious. He provides examples of Caesar's good character. He uses rhetorical questions. He makes the Romans feel guilty. 
he teases Caesar's will. And finally, he humanizes Caesar and brutally describes his dead body. There's so much more I could say. Look for Mark Antony's false humility in lines 122 to 141, or more examples of gory imagery in the description of Caesar's body from lines 175 to 198. Don't forget, this is all just one person's opinion on how Mark Antony persuades the crowd. I hope you enjoyed my take, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for listening, and bye for now.